Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing Nighthawks, released April 10th, 1981. It was written by David Schaber, based on a story by Schaber and Paul Silbert, directed by Bruce Malmuth, with uncredited work from Gary Nelson, and released by Universal Pictures. The original title was ATAC and later Attack, the word Attack, A T T A C K, <laughs> and then Hawks, and then Nighthawks, two words, and eventually the final title, Nighthawks, all one word. Nighthawks is apparently a word used to refer to cops that work the streets at night. All of these titles are terrible. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Uh, I, I think ATAC would have been okay, but you'd have to make it more outlandish and lean into the stereotype stuff. But I wouldn't know what that was yeah i, like, I don't know what nighthawks is well I, I agree i don't know what nighthawks is but either. i think atac of the of the titles that i don't understand that's my favorite but like like swat i understand that title right because everyone like just out of the nature of osmosis you understand what a swat team is mm-hmm. um i i don't think i've ever really heard an atac team is an atac team a real thing uh First of all, second of all, would you know what it was if there were movies called ATAC? Like there are okay. movies called SWAT. So so what you're saying is, had this movie gone with that title, I would know yeah. what it is? Possibly. We don't oh, live in that boy. universe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live in that universe. <laughs> the title had already been used just three years prior for a drama about a gay school teacher. What? <laughs> what? It's called Nighthawks. What? How is that relevant to not, that plot? Not ATAC. <laughs> I should specify. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know how that was relevant there either. That one was originally called ATAC also. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was re- originally called Cruising, but... <laughs> but that was taken by American Gigolo. What? I'm so lost. The original director, Gary Nelson, was fired less than two weeks into production after friction with Stallone about changing scenes on the fly. Or the sly. (laughs) (laughs) He pulled a Steve McQueen and swapped Nelson out for first-time director Bruce Malmuth, who was easier for him to boss around, essentially directing large portions of the film himself. Stallone was the official director for one shooting day as Malmuth made his way to set, but the DGA threw up the usual red flags as, once you start with a director, the star cannot take over the position. The producers appealed the decision since Stallone is a credited director and a member of the DGA, but eventually lost and Universal had to pay a $50,000 fine for allowing Stallone to direct for a day. Stallone was also fined personally for knowingly violating DGA rules, but his DGA status was never revoked. During production, Rutger Hauer lost his mother and best friend and had to leave set multiple times to attend their funerals. Jeez. Like, it was, were, were they together? No, separate Separate incidents. Separate incidents? Yeah. Uh, It was exceptionally difficult, but it became a breakout role for him, as this was his first American film, and he probably wouldn't have gotten Blade Runner if this hadn't been a success. According to some sources, this story began as a third installment of the French Connection series that was retooled in the wake of Gene Hackman's retirement, or one of Gene Hackman's retirements. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, he, 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 Gene Hackman did a lot of movies after this. Yeah. This doesn't seem very French Connection-y. Yeah. I guess there's some, there's some chases. I don't know. It just still doesn't seem very French sure. Connection-y. When Hackman was attached, Richard Pryor was allegedly courted for the Billy D. Williams role. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, you look at... Uh, We're looking at what, what Richard Pryor did in the last year. Yeah. And that's not a worthwhile expenditure of his time yeah, here I, I think and, and and as bad as i feel like billy d williams didn't have enough to do in this movie yeah i, I think he was the better choice totally I, I don't think richard Pryor would have been satisfied with the amount of of stuff to do i don't think he would have been paying attention well, I, I guess that's partially true too <laughs> i don't think i've seen richard Pryor in a lot of things aside from the stuff that we've covered does he do purely dramatic roles he does some I think um, 
the bust and loose that we'll do later this year has more of a dramatic turn for him than we've seen so far. And I mean, and as goofy as and fun as Brewster's Millions is, I think that that's overall kind of a dramatic role. And he skis off of a skyscraper in uh, Superman Three. Oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> Can't wait. That's pretty dramatic. <laughs> The film was originally close to two and a half hours, but scenes were cut between Stallone and Wagner, between Hauer and Kambata, and most of the gore got excised in an effort to make the film more of a fast-moving action story. Even the first cutdown of the gore landed an X from the MPAA, and Stallone handled the re-edits himself to get them down to an R. Luckily, he wasn't part of the Editor's Guild to conflict with right, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Howard's character in the film was based on a real international terrorist known as Carlos the Jackal. Howard was offered twice as much money for the Frank Langella role in Sphinx shortly after accepting this part hmm. and ultimately turned down the other production. I think that movie would have been a lot better with Rutger Howard in it. Sphinx? I think it would have made more sense to me because he's more attractive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no offense, Langella, but you're kind of a weird-looking guy. Even then. <laughs> oh, I like him. I'm just saying. Yeah. It's I. I mean, As a love interest, I yeah. think you're an odd choice. <laughs> I. I'm still I would, addressing him personally. I, I would argue <laughs> Rudger Hauer also is a very strange-looking man. No, not not at the time. Nighthawks. He is. He is gorgeous. I. I don't find him attractive. <laughs> What are you, straight? <laughs> Weirdo? I, I can find men handsome, but I did not. I have never really found Rudger Howard to be an attractive male well, lead. You know, I apologize, never, Mr. Howard. I never seen him with uh, facial hair before. And I and I actually. Oh, you the, liked with the facial I, hair? Oh, yeah, with the beard. I'm like, yeah. But he's wearing a prosthetic nose when he has the facial hair in this movie. That's, 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 Is that's that what good. did it? Yeah, that's what did it. Put me over the top. <laughs> You're like, I need that seam around the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> his the, this description of the plastic surgery just reminded me of James Coburn's line in Hudson Hawk when he's introducing himself. It's like, when you first met me, I was bald with a beard and no mustache, and I had a different nose. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't recognize me, I won't be offended. <laughs> it's widely rumored that during production, Stallone would improvise whole new scenes for himself after seeing Howard's performance, and in his edits, several of Rutger Howard's scenes were removed. Most of the crew agreed that the screen tests with more Hauer tested way better, but Stallone was just jealous of the attention that Hauer was getting, and so he took all those scenes out of the movie so that he could be the main character. Mm. Why does he get final say? Was he a producer on this film? He was, you know, an Oscar-y he, guy. The top name in this movie. Yeah, I, it, he's the reason it got made, and Rutger Hauer is a nobody at the time. We open in dingy New York City at night under a bumping, jazzy score. I actually love the music all throughout this movie. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it gets really goofy sometimes. Yeah, though. I love it, though, the with, whole time. Later on with the helicopters flying in, it was just like circus music. I was like, yeah. what the hell is this? <laughs> the title informs us that it's December 31st. This yes. must be before people celebrated that in, in New York. Yeah, once again, my pet peeve of needlessly setting a movie during a holiday season yeah, we, we and never not need acknowledging to know. it. We never need to know what day it is in this movie. It's never relevant. We see a woman exit a phone booth with a babushka hood. As she moves down the street, a gang of ruffians track her movements. They approach her from all angles, but when they get close enough, she starts beating the shit out of them and then whistles for backup. The woman rips off her disturbing rubber mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I felt I felt so bad. I was like, "Oh God, this woman's really weird looking." Yeah, first she <laughs> first she gets caught in that fire, and then these guys try to mug her, but she takes off her mask, revealing a young bearded Sylvester Stallone as Deke Da Silva. His partner arresting the other assailants is Matthew Fox, played by Billy D. Williams. <laughs> Sorry, you said Matthew Fox. I think about the actor Matthew Fox. Who's the actor Matthew Fox? Uh, well, you you never watched Lost. That is correct. Um, so. <laughs> Who is he? Is he, on, is he only on that? No, no, he was uh, he was in that movie Fifteen Minutes. Oh, oh yeah, the short. It, film, no, no, right? no, not not Fifteen Minutes. Vantage yeah. Point. Vantage Point. Oh, he's like the main guy on Lost. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. He, he was Racer X in Speed Racer in the Wachowski. Oh, okay. There you Speed go. Racer. That's the reference I needed. A photo. <laughs> that and Speed Racer. That's okay. one I've actually seen. <laughs> The last gang member runs for it, and Deke chases him up to the elevated train platform and then corners him at a dead end by the track. 
The man waves a knife at Deke for a while until Deke knocks him out cold. I thought for sure he was going to throw him into this train. <laughs> you thought he was that fucked up of a person well, I thought, I, No, I just thought, like, the scuffle's going to go wrong. Oh, okay. And he's going to get thrown it's, into uh, this train. It's going to happen accidentally during a fight. Yeah. Not like he knocks him out cold and then just throws his corpse on the track. <laughs> yeah. We see Deke dragging the unconscious man through the station, reading him his Miranda rights. You have the right to a legal counsel. You have the right to remain silent. And anything you say can be used in a court of law against you. Amen. We cut back in time a bit to December 31st in London for some reason. <laughs> it, it, so so here, that, this was my question. Is it back in time? It or, is. Or is this arrest happening at, in, on December 31st at like 2 a.m.? Because then it would be like noon in London. I don't know why introduce that it's December 31st in both places. Right? For why? no reason. It doesn't matter. Why are you doing this to me, movie? That's true, though. If it's after midnight, then it could be December 31st here, and then we're cutting live to London where this is happening. Yeah. I hadn't considered that. A bearded young man named Wolfgar is coming up out of the subway. He kind of resembles Rutger Hauer with a prosthetic nose because that's what he is. <laughs> I, I'm going to admit to my embarrassment that I asked you if it was Rutger Hauer at this point. I think that's a common question for people. Okay, because I was like, I don't know for sure. Because it's close I, enough. I've never seen him with facial hair, and he kind, he's he got the eyes. The but eyes like, are the same, yeah. It's not, he doesn't quite look like him, so I was definitely confused. Yeah. He steps into a gift shop, and he flirts a bit with the girl at the perfume counter. As they talk, he shoves a bag under her counter with his foot. He steps outside while she gift wraps the product he asked for, and the entire storefront explodes behind him. He steps immediately into a phone booth and places a call to the United Press to announce that he represents the Wolfgar Command. He tells them that this attack was their work and that he has a long reach. They aren't safe anymore. The way this terrorist group plays out in the film, they remind me mostly of the Bader Meinhof group the Red Army faction, or possibly the Weather Underground, who we hinted at with a small circle of friends and the kidnapping of the president so far in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. We cut forward to January 4th in New York. Very important. We <laughs> skipped the holiday 4th. altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Deke and Fox in plain clothes move through broken down back alleys. The music here kind of reminds me of the MIDI horns in the music for the Mario Circuit course in mm -hmm. Mario Kart. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Nighthawk. <laughs> and here's Mario Circuit. <laughs> The two cops climb a fire escape all the way to the roof of a building where they enter a stairwell and make their way down, both carrying enormous shotguns. I'm assuming that if they went in the front door, there there's, would be, some there'd kind be of... someone watching. Right. There's but... a scanner that waits in the stairwell. Yeah, but but here's the thing. Where are they going to go? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, their only way to go would be further up yeah. if there are guys down below coming up with shotguns. That's true. They bust into an apartment, and it looks like they fire a shot into the ceiling first. I can't tell because it doesn't look like their guns are aimed up, but there, something breaks in the ceiling and dust falls down. So I think they fired a warning shot at the people who live upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> a team of people are producing drugs in the small apartment, and the man in charge tells Fox that he already paid the other cop, and he wants to know how much more to leave him alone. Fox is furious at the implication that he would ever take a bribe, and he busts the guy in the gut with the butt of his shotgun, Deke says to let him go because the guy ain't worth it. And it looks like he's literally just going to murder this person in the middle of the room. It seems weird to me that these guys who, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but their their beat is to go undercover to catch people committing crimes. Yeah, I thought why they were just they, narcotics, but they're trying why, to get mugged also. Why are they busting in? With just the two of them mm -hmm. to a you know a, a room that has like twenty people. Yeah, there should be a raid, not yes. just two guys. You want some backup there, man? <laughs> and and it's weird that they're painting Billy D. Williams as more of the loose cannon, right? Yeah, 
I was like, I mean, I, I think that's fine. If you're going to have the, the buddy cop system, one of them has to be the loose cannon. But, but shouldn't it be the main character? Yeah, Isn't it, that more compelling? Is that, it's usually more interesting. But instead, this one, in this movie, the partner is the loose cannon and the main character is the guy who's crying over his ex-girlfriend. Deke marches them all outside to be arrested, including a young boy. We cut to a fitting room where Irene, played by Lindsay Wagner, is making some alterations to a woman's skirt. Deke and Fox come in the front door this time, and Fox waits in the lobby while Deke goes to have a chat with his ex-wife. He overhears her boss advising her to take an important client out for dinner. Because this is the way we did business in the 80s. When women were first in the workplace, they were like, this is great. You can date all of our customers. Yeah. Yeah. And she we did, and we did she that keeps, in modern romance too. She keeps refusing, and yeah. he doesn't let her say no. Right, but she also doesn't. She doesn't agree to anything. Which well, is she good. she's about to get a, you know, a promotion or something like right. that. Like she doesn't want to jeopardize it. She could be dating even more important clients. <laughs> I was just gonna be. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> that's the next promotion. Kick you both under the table. <laughs> hey, I'm not <laughs> saying that that's good. I'm I'm obviously not defending this system. Irene looks very much like Jane Fonda in 9 to 5 here, actually. And she's insulted at the suggestion, but she notices her ex-husband is watching them. He tells her about the neighborhood that he came through on his way here, and she jokingly asks if he was cruising, possibly a specific reference to the film we covered last year of that title, but he explains it was a dope bust. So, I'm not tuned in to 80s fashion enough to really understand what she's calling out here. Like, I think, first of all, I think he looks ridiculous, but he's wearing, like... Uh, what I thought was a beret at first, but I think it's just like a backwards newsy cap and like a, I don't remember, like a leather jacket or something like that. What is, is he, does he look like a drug dealer? Does he look like a pimp? Does he look like he's just fancy? Like, I'm not sure what she's calling out here. I, I would assume the leather is what she's hitting on with the, with the cruising reference, but um, I don't know specifically because I vaguely remember 1980. Okay. <laughs> Since I no, didn't you don't. Exist. <laughs> he admits that he's here to ask if they could see each other tonight, and she takes him out to a balcony. It's clear from the conversation here that his job got in the way of their relationship, and if he insists on working the streets, they can never be together. She's too busy to continue this conversation with him. January 6th, London. <laughs> a large group of quote unquote college kids are having their annual January 6th party. <laughs> Everyone knows that in London, you celebrate New Year's on the 6th. Yes. Wolfgar is here with his big acoustic guitar, and he meets with a contact at the party who informs him that his handlers are very disappointed with how the bombing went because many children were killed. Well, and why weren't they meeting at a club, as is his M.O.? No, they meet at parties sometimes mm. for no reason other than witnesses are fun. But apparently his handlers aren't, aren't fans of, of uh, child bombing. Yeah. It's frowned upon in their network. I, I refer to them as the bomb ors, and he is the bomb e. Oh, there you go. His boss, Mercer, is so mad about how it went down that he isn't readily paying for the operation. The man tells Wolfgar that they'd like to speak with him, but he swears he didn't tell them anything about where to find him. Wolfgar explains that by coming here, he's led the police right to him. Wolfgar sees the police parking their car across the street, and then he meets three of them as they come up the stairs to the apartment where the party is happening. He puts an automatic weapon behind a guitar and then shoots them through it so they don't see it coming. It was actually a pretty cool move. Mm -hmm. Then he moves back to his contact, Mercer's man, and he says, You go to a better life. And then he shoots the guy in the chest and lets him fall to the floor. Wolfgar leaves, and moments later, one of the college students comes out and screams at the discovery of all of the bodies. Amazingly, nobody heard any guns firing outside. Yeah. He just came outside by coincidence. Later, outside the same building, the chief inspector, presumably of Scotland Yard, is angry to learn that a man named Hartman is here at the scene of the crime. He approaches Hartman and instructs him to keep his mouth shut. I don't want to hear a word from you, Hartman. I don't want to hear that you warned us. Not one word. Understand? and the inspector turns to leave. Hartman immediately delivers the I told you so that the inspector did not want. January 9th, Paris. We see a woman we will come to know as Shaka getting off of a train. She's met by a driver outside the station. Together, they head to an enormous cathedral. Inside, Shaka heads to a confessional booth, and in the neighboring booth is Wolfgar, who called her here. 
which one of them is in the priest side? Wolf I think he is. Okay. Yeah. So so he's already uh, potentially had other people coming in here. Yeah, he's heard yeah. a few confessions. Okay. As long as he absolved them of their sins, it's all yeah. good, right? I wonder if a priest has ever told a football player to do a Hail Mary. <laughs> and then he thought that he meant professionally. But what's the purpose of this meeting place? Like, wh- um, why, why is... Cinematic. <laughs> yeah, why, why is this the preferred meeting place for this? He could have been in the car outside of the train yeah. station. <laughs> There's no reason for this. He collects from her an overdue payment, but it's a little light. In fact, it's barely a payment at all. It's 50 pounds and a ticket to Madrid. Shaka explains that Mercer is very upset that he killed Mercer's courier. Wolfgar says that he didn't have much choice after the man led police right to him, and Shaka explains that the courier died with Wolfgar's passport in his pocket. So now Interpol is on his trail. Shaka says he's not useful to anyone as long as the international authority has his passport and knows exactly what he looks like. So uh, I also have to add that I don't know what was being said here. <laughs> this whole conversation. Oh, you didn't have there the were, subtitles there on? Were, there were no subtitles uh, oh, okay. when, when I was watching this, and I, I thought it was just the the <laughs> i thought it was supposed to be like one of you know you, sometimes you watch movies and and they don't they purposely don't give you subtitles right, right, because right. you're just supposed to be picking up on context clues yeah and i got the context clues so th- that they need to get the f out of dodge yeah i, I got and this it. envelope <laughs> doesn't have what i wanted it to yeah, yeah exactly that's funny though that reminds me of uh, how mel gibson originally didn't want passion of the christ to have subtitles uh, <laughs> it's like well, why even write a script then well that i mean again i would get the context clues Right. But from what I know of the story. But literally nobody would get it because the whole thing is spoken in Aramaic. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I feel like I know that story, though, so you're probably all right. Yeah, just have it be a silent film then. Why waste a microphone's time? Those microphones are busy. <laughs> They're busy people. <laughs> what? Microphones are people, too? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know this? Back in New York, but with no title card to indicate the country change. I, what is happening? Yeah. Where and when am I? <laughs> what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> I need to know the date. <laughs> we see Deke and Fox stepping under a bridge in Central Park. Deke is about to make a huge bust when suddenly a police car pulls off the road and rolls right under the tunnel to deliver a message. Yeah, this this was ridiculous. Yeah, this scene is infuriating, actually. W- one, how would the police officers know where they were? Right. Yeah. Like they're supposed to be like like undercover and going to these kind of random places and, and getting the fuel for things. Like, you know, they don't have a schedule that at ten o'clock we're gonna be under the bridge doing this. And if we were gonna be under a bridge, let's not be under a bridge that a police car could see us from mm-hmm. exchanging briefcases. Like why are we so close to the road? There's bridges that are deep in this park that we could go to. And and he's in disguise. Yeah. Did he did he check with the police? It's like, by the way, this is what I will be wearing. Yeah. Don't come by, but here's exactly where I'll be if you need me. Understandably, Deacon Fox flip out on the other cops who interrupted the sting operation. Their cover is blown for no apparent reason, and they're being called back to headquarters to have a conversation with their boss. Back in Paris, when, where, who cares, Wolfgar and Shaka head to a private surgeon's home to engage his services. This is his home, right? Or like a home office? Yeah. Or it seems like yeah. it's it's a private residence. But this man is to provide Wolfgar with plastic surgery and a new face. Shaka asks if his eyes can be made blue, and it's no problem. Wolfgar jams a metal hook into the doctor's mouth and urges him to complete the operation as quickly as possible. I feel like you're not going to get the best face if you're going yeah. as quickly as possible. <laughs> you could get the Joker situation. Look what I have to work with. <laughs> Once again, no no subtitles for me, but I, get, I got it. Yeah. He wants a new face, and he wants this guy to do it now. Right. <laughs> Back at headquarters, Deke and Fox meet with the lieutenant to discuss the transfer orders they were handed in the tunnel in Central Park. Lieutenant Manafo, played by Joe Spinell, doesn't want to hear any of their shit. Manafo tells them that the police department is working in tangent with a special federal state unit. Deke and Fox have been assigned to an attack group, ATAC, which stands for Anti-Terrorist Action Command which may or may not be a real thing. I didn't bother to look it up. (laughs) Manafo tells them that the transfer orders were handed down from the commissioner who got them from Washington, so there's no superseding this. They can't appeal this decision. They'll be meeting with an agent from Interpol to organize the attack team. And this department will extend every courtesy. Do you understand? No, I don't understand. Get your hands off me! Understand this, sucker! You're a cop and you'll go where you're assigned! 
Now you and Todd will be here tomorrow at 8 o'clock sharp. End of story. Apparently during this film's production, Stallone and Spinell had a falling out. And I'm guessing Stallone wasn't happy about being completely blown out of this scene by Spinell's performance. <laughs> they were good friends and they'd worked together on multiple films up to this, but this is their last film together. We cut to a class being given by Hartman, the man from Interpol, who is teaching his men how to deal with terrorists. We see Wolfgar's new face as he moves through customs. Hartman tells his class that policemen suck because they're brainwashed to not murder everyone they encounter. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was laughing out loud at this entire scene. Yeah, this whole scene is ridiculous. They're too scared to shoot their guns at anyone, and even if they did, they wouldn't know how to use them. But on the attack team, they won't have the option of diplomacy. Instead of listening to Hartman explaining why cops suck, Deke and Fox are just elbowing each other back and forth in the back of the classroom, and Manafo's like standing there like a second teacher, like, hey, cut it out, guys. Listen to what he's saying. It's important. Hartman explains that the biggest problem with policemen is that they wait too long to shoot at people. (laughs) The most important rule is hesitation kills. Hesitation must be removed from the policeman. This is... A very relevant film? I can't believe that this was ever people's opinion of police. Hartman assures them that Wolfgar is likely in New York now. He bases this information on intelligence from the Interpol computer database. But what is this computer basing that on? (laughs) Anything? New York City is also a big city. (laughs) That's true. But that's literally like what it comes down to. Essentially, they think that he can't find work in Europe because of what he did. And now if he wants to make big headlines... New York is the place where headlines come from. That's his logic. He's just like, we're we're more important than other cities. That's why he's definitely here. And nothing gets headlines like holding a cable car hostage. Yeah. <laughs> what? We've got 20 people. <laughs> we see Wolfgar standing outside the United Nations building. Hartman starts a slideshow of Wolfgar's file photos but they suspect that he's changed his appearance with plastic surgery after a surgeon was recently discovered murdered in Paris. Wolfgar carelessly used the same gun to kill this guy as he used to kill other people, so they've traced it back to him. This guy, for being a world-renowned terrorist, kind of sucks at Yeah, him. he's pretty shitty. Apparently his M.O. is that he befriends a woman in the area and uses her apartment as a base of operations. We cut to a nightclub blaring disco music, and Wolfgar is standing at the corner of the bar, sipping champagne, searching for his lady target. He finds a woman and crosses the dance floor to speak with her. He brings his bottle of Moet Shandone from the bar to top off her glass and introduce himself. In his lecture, Hartman is telling his pupils that Wolfgar is especially dangerous because he's no longer affiliated with any specific revolutionary group because of his methods. They suspect that he may attack at random, and as violently as possible, to get as much press coverage as possible. So it's basically an advertisement of his capabilities Mm -hmm. to lure in potential people who need bombs to go off and kill a lot of people. He's filling out, he's padding his resume. Yeah. (laughs) We see Wolfgar and his lady friend standing on a street corner outside ABC television headquarters in New York. She tells him that she's a flight attendant and asks what he does. Me? Mm -hmm. I'm an international terrorist wanted by the police in half the countries of Europe. (laughs) And I am a lady killer. Sure. Sure. She cracks up for all of this, and it is funny, but not for the reasons she thinks. Back in Hartman's class, Deke suggests that all this exposition is a waste of their time because they should be out there hunting him down, but they don't really have enough information to go on yet, which is the whole point of this class. Hartman tells them to pipe down and pay attention. We see Wolfgar now living in the apartment with the flight attendant already, and she left him a note saying she'll be back Thursday. She's not even there. He just gets free reign of the place. Back in Hartman's class, Deke is practically falling asleep with boredom, and so am I, kind of. I get it that we need to show these people learning to be suitable anti-terrorist agents, but the classroom setting they've chosen to show us isn't very compelling, and I would have just preferred a montage of lessons to this drawn-out conversation of Wolfgar's entire life story. It doesn't. It's not interesting to watch. They do have to bring some of it back later for story purposes. But not, a, not, not enough of this is lessons that pay off moving forward and it's just frustrating to sit through that night we see wolfgar blowing up another building at first it almost looks like he's blowing himself up because he's leaning against a doorway and then we see a doorway explode but Mm -hmm. it's the one across the street he calls the press again and tells them that this was a warning that's why he bombed an empty building but why does he have to be here in person when the bombs go off besides just the fetish reason of seeing it happen i think that's it yeah 
Seems pretty dangerous to always be at the scene of the crime when the crime is occurring, when bombs can be set on timers, and presumably the ones we've seen explode already were on timers, because they don't blow up with him in the room. But this is before the age of surveillance. I mean... Yeah, there wasn't cameras everywhere, that's yeah. true. At the scene of the crime, Hartman tells the men that this is all psychological warfare, and he's trying to get into their heads. Once again, Deke suggests that Hartman's classes are a waste of time and that they should be out on the streets tracking this guy down. Oh, once and for all, forget this police academy nonsense. This is a terrorist. He doesn't think like a criminal. He wants to be a hero. And you want to treat him like some mugger on the streets? Get inside the man's head, damn it! Look, I understand that, but how do you expect me to understand that you're training us to be nothing but assassins? And the only difference between him and us will be the badge. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know about the rest of these men, but I didn't join the force to kill people. Oh, for Christ's sake, man! To combat violence, you need greater violence. Is that really the moral of this film? Yeah, I guess that escalation mm -hmm. is okay. Yeah, yeah, and not only is it okay, it's imperative. Yeah. Hartman says that at some point, if they play their cards right, Wolfgar will be vulnerable, and that's when they need to take their shot. And he means that literally. You mean open fire? There's no other way. It's like, what are you talking about? There's no other way. <laughs> There's other ways to apprehend criminals than murdering them. There you could take them out. You're actually not supposed to murder people. You're supposed to arrest them. Arrest them and take them to trial. That's your job. Badly written movies make it really hard to write out the plot beat for beat. Because it'll sound like I'm just repeating myself when I say, Deke just keeps saying he doesn't want to shoot people, and Hartman just keeps saying, don't be a pussy, shoot everyone. <laughs> and that's the, that's their relationship back and yeah. forth mm -hmm. for the middle 30 minutes of this film. Here, Hartman even goes so far as to suggest that Deke's wife left him because he wasn't willing to shoot innocent bystanders. <laughs> and for some reason, this cuts to his core like he believes it. <laughs> Well, it's not my responsibility to be part of an accidental homicide. Oh, for Christ's sake, De Silva! Will you get out of this cop on the beach mentality? Your wife left you for it. Wasn't that enough? Man, I long for the days when the cop on the beat mentality meant minimizing casualties. <laughs> <laughs> Deke's heard enough, and he finally walks out of this useless series of lectures that have taken up a third of the movie so far. As he leaves... Hartman warns that Wolfgar will know his whole background, too, like he's fucking Pazuzu, just an omniscient demon with a full documentation on any cop in the world that could possibly be assigned to his case. Which ends up being true. <laughs> yeah, eventually it is. Deke resigns from the team and everybody else is excused. But this is what was so infuriating. He didn't want this assignment to begin with. And he told him, you don't have a choice. Yeah. And then he just had then a he choice. he just walks away. It's like, are you literally quitting your whole job? Because that's your option here. Fox chases him down to try and keep him from quitting, and we cut to the flight attendant girlfriend of the terrorist going through her closet. She finds a small box that Wolfgar left at her place, and when she opens the case, she finds guns, grenades, bullets, explosives, and immediately just starts fiddling with some of the grenades but, like she has no idea what they are. Again, what a shitty terrorist. You don't lock your... No, it's Box. literally just a click. It just clicks open. Yeah. Why would you just leave that open? Like, just lock your shit up, man. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, Wolfgar is upon her, snatching the grenade from her hand. She apologizes and tries to explain, but he backs her across the apartment and tells her, You go to the bitch and lie. Which is the same thing he said to the last guy he shot, but this time we cut away. Deke pops into Hartman's office after hours to say, Never mind, I want to stay on the attack team, but I'm still not going to shoot innocent people. Hartman is sitting there reading his file and notes that he has 52 registered kills in Vietnam. Let me just say that I have a feeling you'll do the right thing at the right time. I got the impression that the reason he doesn't want to kill innocent people is because he's traumatized by what he did in the war. Mm. But instead they're making it sound like, oh, I, are, I, I know you're a murderer, so you'll murder when, when you need to murder. It'll be fine. Wolfgar pops into a corner store and uses his name like a secret password with the man behind the counter. We cut away to Deke getting a call from Lieutenant Munifo at the scene of the flight attendant's murder. Wolfgar stupidly left a map in her apartment with a <laughs> circle around the building he bombed like a total fucking amateur. <laughs> Best well, terrorist ever. Well, here's the thing, though. That, that's, that's nothing. T to me, this map and this murder and this whole scene 
doesn't give them anything. It does. It leads them directly to him. Well, I mean... He, like, they, within a few hours, they catch him because of this crime scene. They know he's here. Mm-hmm. They they know that he is still practicing his MO. I don't know. He should have just written, like, on the side of a building, like, Wolfgar was here and put a little cartoon guy on there. Well, I mean, the, the problem isn't that, like, he took credit for the bombing. Everyone knows that he did the bombing and he admitted that he did the bombing. The problem is that they know where he's been working is out of this woman's apartment and so they look through all of her stuff and they find oh well he met this girl at a club down the street because she goes to clubs all the time but but they already know that he goes to clubs all the time right but now they know the exact clubs that he goes to or that she goes to but that's not the club that they find it is no because they go to all these other clubs first right they they go to all the clubs that she goes to with a picture of her and the one guy who says yeah she was in here a couple of weeks ago with a blonde guy Okay, so they didn't just find one club. Right, they like, they, they said found... there were all kinds of flyers of clubs. Okay. Yeah. So this, this leads them directly to her. But the doorman says, yeah, she was in here a while ago with, with a blonde guy. And so the doorman walks them through the place, and inside of five minutes, Deke spots him across the dance floor, meaning the entire face-off subplot was a complete waste of time. Because <laughs> it's just like, I literally only have one picture of you, and you have a beard and a different nose, but I can tell that's you. But, like, they have all these insert shots of him sketching throughout the entire movie. Right, like, yeah. I'm just going to casually sketch the face of the terrorist guy, and then I'm going to erase the beard. <gasps> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> like, for some reason, the, the original beard was in pencil. It's like, okay, so this started without a beard, and you added the beard back? <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good with chins. <laughs> <laughs> They cross the club to meet him, and Wolfgar starts to walk away and digs a gun out of his pants. Deke tries a funny trick and shouts Wolfgar at him, and then ducks around a corner so the terrorist will shoot an innocent person in the back. <laughs> yeah, oh my Jesus. God. He shot him in the spine, just like <laughs> permanently paralyzed, if not Ugh. dead, for sure. I, I was like, what are you doing? You're, his whole thing about not wanting to kill innocent people oh but he didn't shoot the gun oh that's true so it's totally fine he only provoked (laughs) him into shooting completely lost the element of surprise all he had to do was casually you know dance up next to this guy and then like slip a mere number (laughs) he's cute yeah i don't know man this guy's neither of them are particularly good at their jobs it seems They chase him out the back door after promising the club owner that they won't cause a disturbance. (laughs) They just leave a dead guy on the dance floor. They chase him through a large underground construction site. Wolfgar unloads his entire clip at them and misses, but Deke is counting the shots and the chase resumes. They have so many opportunities over the course of this chase to shoot at him with nobody around, but they wait until he gets to a subway platform and puts a knife to a woman's neck before they even consider it. They split up, so that they can have a gun on him from two angles, but then Fox just completely ditches his post and comes back around to hide behind Deke. And he's like, take the shot, take the shot, just shouting it in his ear. It's like, there's two of us here with guns. Go around and take the shot if you think it's so easy to take the shot right now. Also, like, there are other people standing behind other posts. Yeah. Like, why tell them to get away? Yeah, like, you are the police. Are they, tell them to leave the area because any one of those people keep peeking their heads out. Yeah. Well, I want to see what's going on. They let him get on a subway with the hostage and politely give them their privacy, offering instead to wait for the tail end of the train to jump aboard. Deke kicks out the back window of the train, and they move forward car by car. Wolfgar ditches his hostage, moving forward toward the front of the train, but eventually Deke and Fox catch up to him, and he jumps out at the next station. Fox <laughs> comes around a corner too quick. <laughs> not not just sorry. any station. On the avenue, I'm taking you to on 42nd Street. I don't know that song. <laughs> no, I think no the one? Venn diagram of songs I know and songs you know <laughs> is just two circles that have never touched each other. <laughs> two abstinent circles. Well, it's a famous song from old. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I got super. When I saw the when I saw the station was 42nd Street. There you go. <laughs> I, I started singing it while I was watching it. So. Fox comes around a corner too quick, and Wolfgar just reaches around the corner with a hunting knife so that Fox runs right into it, and he gets a tiny little slash on his cheek, but he completely gives up the chase because of his (laughs) (laughs) boo-boo. Even Deke is so traumatized by the scratch that he decides to let the terrorist go and beg subway people for band-aids. But, like, there are people around! 
he's just got a cut on the face. It's not like yeah. he's stabbed in the heart. Right. Let them take care of him and just keep running. <laughs> and even Fox wants him to do that. Fox is yelling at him, catch the guy. And instead, Deke just caresses his friend as though he were dying, yelling <laughs> empty threats at disinterested passersby. Kill that son of a bitch! Get him! Get him! You want to kill that son of a bitch? Get him! You're fucking dead! You kill that motherfucker! You're fucking dead! You're fucking dead! You kill that motherfucker! You're fucking dead! You motherfucker! I'm not a professional screenwriter or anything. But a scene like this is where a script would come in incredibly handy. Because then the actors don't have to just flail verbally at the extras around them. And together, they can move the story forward. For no apparent reason, we see Wolfgar escaping on the outside of a train on Mm -hmm. the back, even though nobody's chasing him now. He could have just walked out of the subway system or gotten right onto it. That's not suspicious at all, going on the outside of a train. (laughs) Yeah, he picked the, the worst possible option. At the hospital later, Fox is being wheeled around on a stretcher with his head completely wrapped in bandages because of his scratch. Fox feels guilty for all the fuss being made on his behalf, and instead of apologizing, he pays it backward by telling Deke that everything would have been fine if he just shot that hostage earlier. Yeah. <laughs> you should have took the shot. That, that's the, the speed logic. Right. Shoot, the, shoot hostage. the hostage. You don't shoot him in the face, you shoot him in the legs. Basically saying, what's worse? Killing some old lady we don't even know or getting my jaw nicked because I'm a dummy who runs around corners face first. (laughs) Deke forgets to tell him to go fuck himself and walks out of the hospital. Wolfgar returns to the corner store where the guy knew his name and in the basement he meets with Shaka who tells him that everybody has a description of his new face now. (laughs) What a waste of time. Back to Paris we go. Oh shit, this guy's dead. (laughs) Wolfgar instructs Shaka to gather all the information their crime syndicate has on Hartman and the two cops who chased him today. I imagine, like, they get a phone call at the police station, like, hey, do you know who was chasing Wolfgar today? Can you, can you <laughs> give me their yes. names real quick? <laughs> Deke calls his wife and warns her against befriending any strangers for a while. She asks why, and instead of just fucking telling her, he pretends that he doesn't have enough time to say, I'm tracking a terrorist with a history of making things personal. Instead, he just tells her over and over again, Stop asking questions and don't make new friends, which is exactly something a jealous ex-husband would say, (laughs) so she has plenty of reason to ignore this warning. Before she hangs up, though, she just randomly decides that they can be in a relationship again, and he offers to make dinner reservations later in the week. So, congratulations, (laughs) I guess. Yeah, it's just like, oh, yeah, oh, I guess guess this hunting, this international terrorist that I vowed to kill can wait till after dinner. But also, it's like, I told you the one thing you had to do was stop putting yourself in public danger all the time and we could get back together. And you haven't done that and now I'm in danger so now we can be back together. We cut to a gun range and Deke fires six shots into a target. In the corner store basement, Wolfgar peruses the file on the cops tailing him and we cut to champagne being poured at a fancy benefit at a museum. Deke and the ATAC team, attack team, are working security. Even Fox is here, complete yeah. with cute little band-aids. Yeah, I, I was like, oh, Fox is here. And and he seems really friendly to De Silva. I guess I guess yeah. all is forgiven. Yeah, he, he I think he just got over the shock and he was like, Oh yeah, I'm I'm not dying, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> they chat with each other on big brick walkie talkies about the movements of the ambassador. Seems like a dumb way to do this because all Wolfgar has to do is find the frequency they're on and then he can keep track of the ambassador real easy. Well, yeah, um I, I was thought uh, my words here that I was using is they're very conspicuous, but then Hartman tells them, make sure people to be are, conspicuous. Yeah, yeah. Make sure people see you. Cause it makes them feel secure to hear people shout into walkie talkies. Yeah. Uh, you know, versus having like the little quiet little, ear but still piece. it seems bad to say the ambassador is in this corner of the museum right now. It's like, uh, shut up. <laughs> That's the person we're protecting. Even Hartman is here. He's a part of the team today. Out of nowhere, Deke invites Hartman to Chinese food, despite the fact that they've been at each other's throats for this whole movie. Hartman gets on an escalator and radios to Deke about who's going to pay for their Chinese food when he sees Shaka at the top. Shaka. (laughs) I forgot her name was Shaka, and I thought he said Shocker. Shaka. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, Shaka. Because he he has the British accent. Yeah. So if he was saying Shocker. Like a valley girl? (laughs) Yeah. Shaka. (laughs) He's Uh, just like going up the escalator like, Ooh, what a twist. Yeah. <laughs> but because but because 
I thought he said shocker. I was like, have we seen this woman before? I was like, oh, no, wait. This is... This is the this woman. This is that the, woman. The woman Does who's not his ex-wife. Her? Was there a scene that I missed where they were together and he didn't know No, but they woman? showed her picture in the class. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but she pulls out a gun and she shocks him by shooting him in the face. Uh, Deke hears the gunshot and races to Hartman's location. Lieutenant Monifo is there and he says that all the exits are manned. She won't get away. But Deke and Fox insist that she's gone already because she's like a a shadow in the night yeah well also that it doesn't matter because this this wasn't about like they were concerned that there might be an attack right on the and then one. he's like no 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 yeah. this was the attack yeah also he says don't turn him over and i wasn't sure what that meant like maybe yeah he was is there a bomb trapped? on him yeah <laughs> yeah i thought that at first too we cut to a crowd of people boarding a car of the roosevelt island sky tram among them are shaka and wolfgar Shaka leans over the controls and jams the brakes to stop the car 250 feet over the river alongside the bridge. I don't know anything about New York City. I don't either. I assume this is a bridge. It goes over water. It, it, so, but <laughs> yeah, well, no, it, it, you were correct. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which bridge. Uh, over troubled waters, no. Roosevelt uh, Bridge? That's uh, my guess. So Roosevelt Island is this island that's in the middle of the river, and I guess it's like a touristy place to go. Okay. Um, and that's I guess that's why they take this goofy little car. Yeah, I, I guess that's like there is a road that goes there, but I guess if you're a pedestrian, this is the most efficient way? Question mark. I think this the is island? the same thing that it appears in Spider-Man Two, or yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the Spider-Mans. It, it's like one of those, one of those things that helps identify that this is New York City, right? Wolfgar pulls out his Uzi and he informs everyone that this is no idle threat. Do not underestimate her because she's a woman. She has no maternal instincts. An eight-month-old baby begins crying in the corner. Also, thanks for using my real name, dick. Yeah, well, that uh, doesn't matter. We're, they were probably planning on killing all these people anyway. Were they? Who cares? <laughs> Wolfgar calls down to the control tower and says that there are UN reps on board and he will list his demands as soon as they can get Deke in front of him. Fox and Deke are ordered to the scene, and when he gets there, Deke jumps into an ATAC helicopter and flies right up to the tram. Wolfgar puts all the hostages against the windows. He grabs the wife of the ambassador's assistant and puts her against the window facing Deke in the helicopter. It seems like Stallone was worried he might get accused of overacting here, so he stepped it way back. This one's for you, De Silva. Oh, Christ, don't do it. Oh, God damn it, Matt, he killed her. I <laughs> it's like the most <laughs> muted performance. <laughs> oh, God, don't do it. Blam. Oh, God damn it, Maddie killed her. I was a little shocked by this. <laughs> yeah. They dump the woman's body into the river below. Wolfgar tells them that there's a baby on board and that he would like to hand it over safely so that people don't think he's a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> he also wants De Silva to be the one to collect the baby because he doesn't care if people think he's racist. <laughs> There were two cops after you in the subway, and only one of them is your mortal enemy for no apparent reason. Stallone himself actually hops out of a chopper without it landing, which was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Like, it gets yeah, low it, to the ground, and, and then he jumps him. out. Yeah, for sure. It's all one shot. And then he gets wired up on a barge to connect with a line descending from the tram car. Wolfgar winches him up into the tram. Stallone has said that hanging from this cable car is the most dangerous stunt that he's ever done, and they even gave him a knife in case the untested cable snapped and he fell hundreds of feet into the river so that he could cut his harness off so that the the 300 pound rope wouldn't drown him when it sank to the bottom of the river Mm. i was also like i feel like i need more logistical conversations about this not just i'm gonna hand the baby over to the silver like i need it i need it more i'm like how is this happening i'm gonna toss you a baby we're on three and everybody just understood no you come you you jump off a helicopter you get on a boat you get a harness i'm gonna lower a winch and then there was a boat there (laughs) with a harness already (laughs) waiting for this hook to come down he also said he's like you only got five minutes so you better hurry and i'm like what what you just gonna drop the baby if he doesn't show up that's gonna show him you're not a maniac more than five minutes yeah, to get all exactly. the way up. Yeah, all that, all that down all the way. Yeah, what is what is the plan if <laughs> if we don't? Maybe we just stack pillows on the barge and you drop the kid. <laughs> I was going to reference our Patreon movie and go pull a zero with that baby. Just <laughs> whoop. <laughs> uh, it's not mine. Who cares? <laughs> 
He moves on to the next, most pathetic stage of his dastardly plan, forcing Deke at gunpoint to recite words to the ambassador. I want you to tell him I have brought the city to its knees. Police! My cowards. What? I said. Tell him. He's brought the city to its knees. Police are cowards. Now say police are duty heads. <laughs> is, is this doing it for you? <laughs> you like this? The baby cries some more, and Wolfgar makes the woman hand it off to Deke. When when he told him to say that, I thought he was saying like say that to the to press the, into the radio or what? Or or is like I didn't mean like tell it to these passengers. It's like it's like they can all hear you instructing me. <laughs> what is the relevance of the word coming out of my mouth when you have a gun to a baby's head? <laughs> Literally anybody would say anything in this situation. I I would say you are my lover and I want to take you away from all this. Yeah. (laughs) I would say that anyway. Not me. (laughs) As we've established, Rutger Howard just doesn't do it for Richard. (laughs) Shaka lowers him out of the tram and I really wanted Wolf Carr to just cut the line. (laughs) He just falls all the way down to the the barge with this kid. Uh, The end. Well, and like at this point, I'm super confused. Like, I really, we've established already that I don't think he's a great terrorist, but I'm just like, I thought like the whole point of convincing him to get up here to was take that the he baby, was going to be a hostage. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally. I, I, um, I, I didn't feel that. What I felt was it was just to say like, oh look, look how close you are to me, but you can't do anything about right. it. Right. Uh, um, but also there's. I, I feel like they chose a really poor location for the climax of this, and and it's also weird. not nearly as many hostages as they need. Right. Yeah. Like it was like because if you're if you're talking about like bombing whole like population centers, yeah. Then we'll just we'll just cut down the tram. Yeah. You got, the end. Like, <laughs> I mean, obviously we'll do our best to try to save people, but at least it's isolated enough from yeah. anything. But like you just. I really don't feel like he's got a lot of leverage here. Yeah, right. I didn't know how he was going to get out of this mm-hmm. one alive. I'm like, you have to land this tram, and the second you do, it's not going to go well. Right. Well, and and it's weird because he even seems to know that because he says to Shaka later, "I don't think we're going to get out of this one alive." Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh it shit! I should have thought of this. Plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is why no one will employ you anymore in Europe is because you're super <laughs> careless. That wasn't even the right store you blew up. Yeah. With the baby, he also handed Deke a note to deliver to the rest of the attack squad. He wants his proclamation to be published in the papers. <laughs> and then Billy D. Williams is like, we don't control the papers. And he's like, shut up. I don't care. <laughs> Just put it in the papers. Also, he says, you can drop the baby, but don't drop this. Yeah. Uh, but he wants a bus to be waiting, and the bus will take him to a jet. No cops. No cops, obvs. That's what it says in the note. OBVS. And release a bunch of random prisoners of war. I guess that's to, like, make it good with the prospective clients in the future. Yeah, but I don't know if this was, like... People what, he cares about at all. Yeah, was this, like, a Hans Gruber moment where, you know, he wants he wants Asian Dawn released? Yeah. Because it's just, like, just give them something to do to be yeah. distracted with? I think it's more just, like, people will owe me favors if I get these five people out. Deke rushes into the attack computer bay and requests a recording of Hartman's lecture on Shaka and a way to play it from speakers under his uniform. This is the most pointless turn of the plot. Like, I feel like this has to be something that Stallone was like, I have an idea for four scenes to add Mm -hmm. that are completely worthless. Let's do it. We have the locations already. I I thought the plan was to make Hauer think... Hartman was still alive and like talking to him over the radio. And then what difference would that make to anybody? Well, because the, cause Shaka was supposed to have killed him and, and like she turn against her because she, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. She's like, I thought you killed Hartman. You told me you killed him and then make them turn against each other. Yeah. Okay. Because I was like, what else could this possibly be used for? And it turns out nothing. Yeah. Literally nothing. Hours later, Deke arrives with the requested bus and Wolfgar pulls the tram into the emptied station. He uses the hostages as a human shield to guard him between the tram and the bus. Fox loads a sniper rifle nearby to fire on the terrorist, but he can't get a clear shot yet. 
Plus, and he's for holding... some reason, he's not taking it anyway. Take the shot. Yeah, take the shot. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing. I mean, the guy, Roger Howard is holding a, I'm assuming, live grenade in his hands. Right. So what? Take the shot, dude. Take the shot. Shoot the grenade out of his hands first. Yeah. But in such a way that the hand will continue to grip the grenade after it's removed from his body. Wolfgar urges his hostages onto the bus when suddenly the recording of Hartman describing Shaka starts playing and he refers to her as a spoiled bitch who kills without provocation and somehow this is insult enough to lure her away from the hostage pack so that Fox can get a clean shot on her. This is my question though. Does she know Hartman's voice specifically? No. Like, are they BFFs? Does she no. know him? She okay. just knows someone called her a jerk. So why <laughs> did he need the recording? He could have just said that shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he could have. I don't understand this whole, this whole Hartman yeah, recording thing. I, I don't I don't get why. But they literally built a harness around him right. with a speaker box that and, would play a, a recording. That he yeah, just he's, a, he's a walking talk boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey kids, kids we're home early. early. <laughs> Stop drooling on me. <laughs> they should have s- sold this whole get up and called it a hawk boy. <laughs> 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 but anyway, <laughs> so he says, Hey, Shaka smells. And then Shaka's like, What? I don't smell. And then Fox shoots her in the head. Yeah, and and it's such a weird insert of her being shot in the head and But it's like right in the forehead. Yeah. Like it's not even it's brutal. But she's like in some kind of black void. Right, yeah. Like it, it it's, it's this, an insert they shot later. Yeah, exactly. And it's like now just fall down like you fell asleep. Yeah. Shaka when the walls fell. <laughs> uh, Jesse, you get that reference? It's a Star Trek thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> I didn't get it. Wolfgar sprays his Uzi at everybody and then drives the bus off the bridge (laughs) with only him inside. Dar Robinson was the bus stunt driver here, and this is a super dangerous stunt. It's probably the most dangerous stunt in the movie because the risk of him knocking himself unconscious when the bus hit the water, he had to be in it when it hit the water. Why not just have the bus drive off without anyone in it? Because it wasn't possible to do the way that they staged the scene where the bus is sitting there, then it starts moving. I I mean, presumably you could rig something by radio to remote control it, but that was probably outside of their budget. And so they needed someone to be in the thing to start it moving and drive it off the bridge. Seems like just putting a brick on the gas pedal is better than having to put that walkie talkie from the museum scene on the gas pedal. Deke watches it sink below the surface, but he isn't buying it. ATAC and NYPD personnel descend on the bodega that Wolfgar was using as his base of operations after they found an address on Shaka's body, which, again, what is this fucking amateur hour bullshit (laughs) that you keep your home base circled on a piece of paper in case you forget where it is? Deke is flipping through the paperwork there, and something catches his eye before he runs out. He hands the papers to Fox and calls his ex-wife. The phone rings out, but she isn't home. We see her coming down the sidewalk in a big fur coat, and then she moves up the steps to her apartment, and the camera pans across the street to reveal Wolfgar waiting for her. He follows her up the steps. Inside the apartment, we can hear her working in the kitchen. Wolfgar forces open the door and then just busts the chain lock off the wall, somehow yeah. silently. It's pretty pretty impressive. He moves into the kitchen where Irene is working, and he spies on her through a red window. At first, I thought this was like a post effect, and it was supposed to be terrorists, murderous POV. <laughs> like he's the fucking predator. But I, then I thought she was developing photos in her kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever realized it wasn't just a silly, like. It's effect. literally. It's not a silly effect. It's a red window that he's looking through in the kitchen. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I got that. I'm like, why is it suddenly red? I, did this <laughs> transfer go bad? <laughs> Who cares about this scene? Wolfgar approaches her with just a knife while she does dishes silently, and he gets real fucking close when she finally turns around, and it's fucking Stallone (laughs) in a robe and a wig, and they just stare each other down for a moment, and then Deke shoots him once, but somehow hits him five times, because his his shoulders are already exploded, and his chest is all bloody. When he turns around, and it's Stallone, I was like Lucille Bluth going, Gee! (laughs) <laughs> yeah, totally. It's yeah. it's 
an SNL moment. I was, it feels like something in a MacGruber movie. Yeah. I was so goddamn excited. I think it's you heard me squeal the from part. the other room. You did, and you worried that you, you ruined the movie because for Because I was so but, surprised. But I, I did not see it coming because that's so fucking corny and stupid. <laughs> yeah. I could never have but guessed like, that they would stoop this low. As they're approaching this woman like as the camera's approaching like it's Wolfgar like the shoulders are huge and like the <laughs> yeah. wig yeah. is bad yeah uh, even <laughs> even when he's coming down the hallway and you see the legs it's like, like they're less now. convincing than Danny DeVito's yeah. legs in Going Ape <laughs> it's just like those are man legs that's the, that's a man <laughs> but I seriously did not expect for Stallone to be here like I just thought that he wouldn't have the balls to be in drag for this one scene where it's like you were supposed to be believably your wife cooking at this ki- and and he's cooking but he's cooking with his gun in a Ziploc bag so that it doesn't get wrecked mm-hmm. and he's got it down in the water in the sink and then when he pulls it up out of the water then he just shoots through the bag I feel like that's Rutger. also completely unnecessary right just keep it in your robe and yeah pull or it just out. have it you know out of view in the sink but yeah you already have the element of surprise by being here in place of his ex-wife yeah you didn't need the gun to be hidden even if she was standing there just washing a gun in the sink he still would have snuck up on her with a knife <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i love the just the the look of confusion on howard's face it's like <laughs> it's like he it's like he had just watched dress to kill and now he's this is happening he's like oh my god <laughs> yeah for this scene one of howard's squibs was installed backward and exploded toward his chest badly burning him there was also cables in place to yank him backward with each shot, and Stallone had secretly ordered the cables to be pulled much harder than in rehearsal, injuring Howard's back, and Howard blew up at him, not caring that he was the big star of the film, threatening to break his balls if he tried something like that again. Wolfgar raises the knife again to stab at him, and then a second bullet throws Wolfgar through the double doors to the apartment down the steps and out onto the street. Stallone sits on the stoop beside the body and waits through the credits like he's actually sitting here not moving for like three or four minutes with this body as the credits roll over them. And that's the end of our film. But yeah, that last scene was much bloodier in the original cut and they took it all out. But he originally shot him the same way that he shot the target. So it was shoulder, shoulder, you know, face. Gut, gut, face, heart. And, uh, and that's not the way it ends up um obviously it's great uh no it's it's pretty corny and i'm interested to see what the two and a half hour cut looked like because i would like to see this movie before it was chopped up unintelligibly i wouldn't mind more gore but to be honest i don't know that there's a lot of scenes you could put back into this to be like oh this is a really good yeah, story i don't <laughs> think they'd make it better but honestly maybe that's all i wanted was more of the gore yeah I don't need two and a half hours of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> See another one hour of Rutger Howard getting shot in the face. Well, even even this cut felt like there were things that could be trimmed out. Yeah. Like take out all the school stuff. Yeah, the 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 school stuff went on for long. Or if you're gonna do the school stuff, then it needs to be more interesting than them just sitting at desks and being talked to. Yeah, and it's literally just exposition. It's not like he's right. teaching them how to be agents. He's literally just giving them information that could have been a dossier. Yeah. But most of it is not anything that we need. Like, maybe explain right. his partner is Shaka, but that's about all we need out of that. all of those scenes. Yeah, the core lesson of that entire, like, shitty TED talk was shoot people, shoot bad people when they're bad. And he learned the lesson, I guess, but they were probably doing that the whole movie. Only at the beginning of the movie, they were arresting people like, like you're supposed to. If that's the whole point, like, to shoot, like, they were trying to convince him to shoot. Like, the climax of this movie, he's alone in the room with this person. It's first not of all, like he took the shot and there was people around. Yeah, first of all. Second of all, Rucker Hauer has a knife in that scene. He's not pointing a gun at Stallone. Yeah. Stallone should have disarmed and arrested him, not yeah. shot him six times. Yeah, no, no. he is a you cop. Got, you gotta <laughs> shoot people. But that's not true. Like... The, the lesson of this movie should have been, fuck that guy that died on an escalator like an idiot. I'm going to arrest this person like I'm supposed to. Yeah. After I said I wanted an hour of gore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I feel like the the foot chase scene that goes through a subway Ugh. tunnel. Onto a, s- onto a train, onto another train. <laughs> yeah, onto a train, then <laughs> off of a subway, and then through subway. I was like, uh, what, is, what is happening? Also- 
I don't, and again, I don't know anything about uh, mass transit. Are these subway trains unmanned? Yeah, this one seemed to be because they go the whole way to the front car and it was like, all it's passengers. Like, it's like, tell no, them to stop. A conductor. But, but that's what I was saying. Like, like tell them to, st- when they can't get into the train, like when Robert Howard goes in and the train doors won't open, it's like, tell them to stop the train. Like, who's controlling the train? Um, and, and then when they go, when they break in the windows in the back, there's no one there. And they make their way all the way to the front of the train. And there's and nobody it, in the front. And it's just like, tell them to stop the goddamn train. Yeah. Yeah, I, f- I feel like it's, uh, you know, uh, taking a Pelham 1, 2, 3, where it's just Jerry Stiller in an office somewhere flipping <laughs> switches. Maybe. There's nobody in that thing. But yeah, um, th- there's about 30 seconds of this movie I would recommend to people. <laughs> yeah, but is it is that 30 seconds worth it if you haven't sat through the rest of that shit? <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe maybe... You, there's something about being bored for an hour and a half that makes that last moment that exciting. Makes you squeal. <laughs> but there's really there's really not much else to the movie that I would be like, this was a fun scene or like this was yeah. interesting the way they did this. I, the only thing I did like was when when Rucker Hauer fires the Uzi through the acoustic guitar mm. at the guys coming up mm-hmm. the stairs. That was cool. But aside from that, yeah. Seizing this gondola and making him say that I've brought the city to its knees is like Yeah. Uh, I don't think hardly anyone really knows what's going on here. You've yeah. brought the city to a sneeze. Yeah. Um, That's all you've done here. And, it didn't actually sneeze. You just yeah. brought it right there. I killed one person and I dropped her in the river. Yeah, You're it, all on your knees for me now. Well, I, and and I, and I had mentioned, this is an aside for you people, but uh, uh, I had mentioned just Patrick that I just watched Dire with a Vengeance. Yeah. And that's how you bring a goddamn city to its knees. Yeah. You you, a, you block huge roads and you steal a whole fucking bank basement. Yeah, uh, but also you threaten that you've put a gigantic bomb in a public school, and if you evacuate any schools, they're gonna it's gonna blow. This he's got a gondola full of people, no explosives except maybe a couple of grenades. Like he, he, for someone who's obviously his mo is to blow up buildings, taking hostages on a gondola seems counterintuitive C- counterintuitive very at the very least put a bomb on the gondola yeah and not be on it he yeah. also has no goals in this movie mm-hmm. because he's been disassociated yeah, he doesn't work for anybody yeah. he's not doing this at anyone's request and it's not like he's trying to get money and it's not like he's trying at, at the end of this movie his only goal is to get away from the situation he just put himself in he's yeah. like, literally what? he's he's literally He's getting paid in exposure for this. Yeah. That's the, he's like an intern terrorist. Yeah, yeah. he's like the a influencer. graphic designer who's just like, oh, I guess I'll just make this for free. I'll just blow up these people for free, and then if someone likes my work, they'll contact me. It's embarrassing, and and he's also super shitty at this job. Like we've covered, yeah. he just leaves a fucking trail of breadcrumbs right to himself. I was like. And he's got like his address written on the inside of his coat jacket in case it gets stolen or something yeah. like that. Where the oh yeah we've because when they got to the bodega, I was like, how did we get here? And, and I went and went back. I was like, what? She literally <laughs> wrote it down on a piece of paper and kept it on her while she was out working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes no sense. And, and but and what did it say? Like it was literally just secret hideout and then an address <laughs> like you get there you get you get to the address and you see that it's, oh it's a bodega it's so. a bodega you, you go in and you ask the guy a couple of questions i mean did they get a search warrant i mean it'd th- be pretty quick if they did yeah because they went right there yeah exactly uh, maybe the guy just turned over on him right away i mean maybe but they're arresting him it's just like or maybe he wasn't even there and they just busted no, they him. Arrest oh, him they arrested him upstairs. yeah he's mm-hmm. being arrested uh, but i'd be i asked for some kind of immunity <laughs> yeah I mean, I guess everyone, because yeah, no, because Roger Howard was still alive at that point. So, uh, yeah, I'd be like saying, "Hey, I'll tell you whatever you need to know." But, yeah. like, I get why the flight attendants are letting him stay at their places because they don't know that he's actually an insane terrorist. But this guy does, and he still says, "Yeah, leave your shit all over the place. I don't care. Yeah, just litter my basement with clues, please." Mm-hmm. And and the strict attention to dates at the beginning. Yeah, and then completely abandoning that. For it the looks rest like they of ran the out movie. of money for titles. <laughs> it's like, what? Why were we keeping such specific track of the time, and completely ignoring New Year's? Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's like every single scene. Yeah, like, uh, there was a cold open that was like December twenty fifth, and they're just at a restaurant for yeah. some reason, and then it's just like, 
It, it, do you just go from holiday to holiday throughout the whole year for no reason? Yeah, like, like or, or some kind of line about ringing in the new year. Yeah. Like, I mean, come on. It's so obvious. Yeah. And then it's just January all of a sudden. Then mid-January, apparently. Because I don't imagine that this flight attendant let this one night stand just crash at her place for, for while she's well, not there. Well, it depends on what kind of an apartment this is. If this is where she lives and she and she's working somewhere else or if this is a base that she flies to oh. and this is where she stays when she's in town that's, that's usually the flight attendants are given hotels that are close to the airport that the airline would pay for but maybe she wanted her own place and this is a place that she flies to regularly so she keeps a second place i don't know it maybe doesn't she matter. maybe she likes to have an apartment with a boyfriend in it for when she's away from her husband mm-hmm. and children <laughs> who knows that's her prerogative anyway uh thumbs down no, I think it's a thumbs up just because of the last moment, even if the movie's kind of bleh the whole way to it. Because that it saves the movie. It does. It saved the movie. I was happy at the end of the movie. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty terrible. If there was like 30 seconds more like denouement after that mm-hmm. happened, this would be a thumbs down for me. But because it's like funny part, credits, and then I'm like, okay, yeah, you got me. Brian Cox, you know, wow them in the end and you've got a story. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think I would tell anybody to watch this movie, though. I would just tell them the ridiculous ending and be like, yeah, save you. Save <laughs> just you spoil the- it. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> oh, my God. That's the movie at the end where Stallone does this thing where he's in drag, right? And he's 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 he pretends to be a woman for the last scene. That's that's the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> you've seen it, it all now. Sounds like me, yeah. <laughs> would have been really funny if he's trying to do oh, i don't know what do women do in the kitchen uh dishes like like he just can't figure out what he's supposed to do he he's just rubbing his own dishes. boobs <laughs> he's like facing the sink but rubbing himself he's covering he's himself like... in lemons because he's so out of city ceviching himself <laughs> or he's, he's holding up a, he's got like a framed photo of him of his character and he's like touching it yeah and, like, just petting a photograph of sloan <laughs> <laughs> and Roger I was coming in going yep that's his wife alright <laughs> she loves the same man I'm trying to hurt <laughs> that's perfect so yeah I also struggle with the thumbs up it is a thumbs up but it's yeah it's, hesitant it's very hesitant and it's one had it had it not had that scene, it would have been a thumbs up. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no question. Yeah. I just um, I, I guess I just don't think it saves the entire movie. I think people expect for me and Richard to recommend this movie to them though. And they don't That's they true. expect you they, to they, save they, their they, time. They expect me to have better taste yes, than you two. Exactly. <laughs> That's my discerning. point. <laughs> um Letterbox, what are we thinking? So I have it at number twenty seven out of forty two. Okay. It is below Blood Beach and above Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen. Richard, what do you got? I, I have it very high, I guess, relatively. I have it at number 17, um, which puts it below Fort Apache, but above American Pop. I have it closer to Richard. Um, it's above Fort Apache and below the Fun House, which puts it in 20th. To be fair... Uh, Blood Beach is the only thing that stands between this and Ford Apache and the Fun House, but I have it lower on my list than you guys do. So yeah. I think we all agree about where it's at. I just yeah, have a lower regard to these for movies. those movies. <laughs> yeah. Our director here was Bruce Malmuth. Surprisingly few credits. He later directs Steven Seagal's Hard to Kill and Dolph Lundgren's Pentathlon, but he also plays the ring announcer in Karate Kids 1 and 2. The uncredited director, Gary Nelson, is a longtime TV director who took on a pair of Disney features, Freaky Friday and The Black Hole, and then did mostly TV moving forward, with the exception of Jimmy the Kid and Alan Quartermain and The Lost City of Gold. Yeah. He also directed 19 episodes of Early Edition, a show that me and Richard reference weirdly often. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Story and writing credit for David Shaber. He had previously written The Warriors and Those Lips, Those Eyes. Later this year, we'll get Rollover, and then in 1990, he wrote Hunt for Red October. So, wide range from that Yeah, guy. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Story here, Paul Silbert. This is his only story credit. He has mostly production designer credits on titles like The Drowning Pool, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Heaven Can Wait, Kramer vs. Kramer, 
Resurrection for 1980, and this year he'll work on Blowout and Wolfen. The music here was from Keith Emerson. Emerson was the keyboardist for power trio Emerson, Lake, and Powell, whose song Touch and Go is featured prominently on the MacGruber soundtrack. Mm -hmm. He composed this film right on the heels of composing for Dario Argento's Inferno in 1980, and he later scores Godzilla Final Wars. Nice. Can you take that again? You said Powell. That's what I have typed here. It's Palmer. Is it? Okay. Thank you for catching that. I take it back. There were two bands. Oh, they were two bands? Emerson, <laughs> Lake, and Palmer? Emerson, well, Lake, and Powell? Because you said Powell, and I'm like, well, no, it's Emerson, Lake, and, and Palmer is the name of the band. And then I looked it up, but there is a Emerson, I'm assuming Lake, it's the and same Powell. band, and they just switched a guy out. Yeah. Can you look up who performs Touch and Go? Uh, well, luckily, you have them both recorded. Powell. Yeah. Yeah. It is Powell. Okay. Yeah. Cinematographer James A. Contner. This is his third film as DP, and we've covered them all. Cruising and Times Square were the first two, and he's back later this year with So Fine, which I'm assuming will be his fourth dingy New York yeah, film. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, it's actually not that dingy. I think that one's a comedy. And later, Jaws 3D, The Last Dragon, Michael Mann's Heat, and George Romero's Monkey Shines. He also directed a bunch of Star Trek Enterprise, Buffy, Charmed, and Angel. Editor Stanford C. Allen previously edited Silent Movie, Rabbit Test, Rocky II, and last year, The Hollywood Nights. The other editor, Christopher Holmes, previously edited Five Easy Pieces from our Patreon episode, then Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. After this, he cuts The Natural, The Last Dragon, Bugsy, and The Patriot. Sylvester Stallone played Deke Da Silva. He's Rocky, he's Rambo, he's Tango, I think. He's Stud, probably. <laughs> He's the linchpin of the Expendables franchise, and we'll see him later this year in Victory. He also has screenwriting credits on a significant percentage of his own movies, and he's directed a bunch of the Rockies, one of the Rambos, and an Expendable. The, f <laughs> the first of the Expendables. Billy D. Williams was Matthew Fox. He's Lando Calrissian. He's Harvey Dent in some stuff. He's Two-Face in other things. We've seen him previously in Empire Strikes Back and our Patreon review for the original Out of Towners. Lindsay Wagner was Irene. She's back later this year for Stuart Raffles' High Risk. At the time, she was best known as Jamie Summers on The Six Million Dollar Man and her eventual spinoff, The Bionic Woman. She's kind of wasted in this movie, but apparently there were more scenes of her that didn't make the cut. Both she and Stallone have complimented each other's performance in the missing scenes, and my guess is that they were more scenes of him begging to take her back, but that Stallone thought it made his character look pathetic and he had them cut. Uh, and I think it's actually probably better yeah. To, to not have the the amount of character development was pretty much all that I needed from that relationship. And apparently in the scene, he's sobbing the whole time trying to win her back. And I think he watched that and he was like, people aren't going to buy this guy as an action hero. We got to take this stuff out. If, if anything, I feel was underdeveloped was a relationship between Stallone and Billy D. Williams. Yeah. I Because I, they seem like a close knit group, but I would like to know more. Sometimes. About that. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they're dicks to each other. <laughs> Stallone blames the studio for the scenes disappearing with Wagner, though. And fairly recently, she provided the voice of Bridget Strand, the president of the United States, in Death Stranding. Persis Kambata played Shaka. Just before this, she was Ilya? Ilya. Ilya. Emphasis on the Lee. Ilya? Ilya. Ilya. I'm going to make you second guess this before I say it. <laughs> Just before this, she was Ilya in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Which I think is the V'ger character. <laughs> well, it, yeah. So she starts off as her own individual, but V'ger takes her and brings her back, but not as herself, as like a robotic clone. Right. Who delivers the message right. of the V'ger. Just after this, she was Zara in Megaforce. She was considered and eventually passed over to play the title character of Octopussy a role that later went to Maude Adams for her second role of the franchise. A missed opportunity for the franchise, if you ask me. I think mm -hmm. Persis Kambata would have been great. I know her best as Zia from MacGyver episode To Be a Man, where she plays the mother of A.J. Naidu. That's the episode where she's married to Sid Haig and right, then they right, kill right. him. In the early 80s, she was in a terrible car accident and required bypass surgery and then passed away 15 years later at 49 from a heart attack. Nigel Davenport played Peter Hartman, He's back later this year as Lord Birkenhead in Chariots of Fire. In 74, he was Dr. Ernest D. Hubbs in Phase 4. 
Yeah, that, that that's how I stumbled onto that. Yeah, I was like, I was like, what is this movie? Yeah, it looks great. I I wonder if because you said Saul Bass directed it, right? Yeah, it's his only feature film. Yeah, and I wonder if he designed the poster too. I would assume he would I, I want to design so, his own poster. But I'm I'm looking forward to it being on a, our next movie night because I think it's gonna be great. Yeah. Uh, Nigel Davenport is also in A Man for All Seasons and the 77 Island of Dr. Moreau, and he's essentially playing a proto-Brian Cox character here. Apparently, he and Brian Cox played the leads of a short film called The Cutter in 1992 about a kid joining a secret society of assassins, but I couldn't find a full short beyond the two-minute trailer. But I was just like, these guys look so much alike. I wonder if they've ever played family members. And they didn't. (laughs) They're just (laughs) both in this. Rucker Hauer was Wolfgar. This was his first American movie, but he stuck around for titles like Blade Runner, Lady Hawk, The Hitcher, and more recently, Hobo with a Shotgun. Sadly, we just lost him in 2019, the same year his character dies in Blade Runner. Spoiler alert. Uh, I also thought it was funny that, that he was in Lady Hawk, and I was desperate to find a third Hawk movie <laughs> so I could do like, so the Rudger Hauer Rudger Hawk Hawker. trilogy. That'd be good. Joe Spinell played Lieutenant Monifo. He's a regular co-star of Stallone's before this as Gazzo in Rocky and Rocky II, and Burp in Paradise Alley. <laughs> We've reviewed nine of his titles so far. Little Dragons, Cruising, Ninth Configuration, Forbidden Zone, Brew Baker, Melvin and Howard, The First Deadly Sin, and this year we've had him in Maniac and this, and he's basically our show mascot at this I point. I just super appreciate that you didn't make me try to name them all. <laughs> You're welcome. Cesar Cordova played Puerto Rican proprietor. That's the next most famous character <laughs> on my list. Uh, he was the garbage truck driver that wasn't Billy Drago in Cutter's Way earlier this year. <laughs> Tony Monifo played Big Mike. Wait, Does that what? name sound familiar? Yeah. Monifo. He played Lucan's guard in Just Tell Me What You Want last year. He was a boxer in Rocky II. He's a producer on most of Stallone's movies. Cobra, Over the Top, Rambo 3, Lock Up, Tango and Cash, Rocky V, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Cliffhanger, Demolition Man, The Specialist, Judge Dredd, Assassins, and Daylight. And, and it's not pure, coincidentally. Pure coincidence. Not coincidentally. <laughs> He shares the name of the character being played by Joe Spinell in this film. (laughs) Howard Stein played Disco Manager. This was his only acting credit. He has mostly visual effects credits, including Empire last year, Raiders this year, Dragon Slayer this year, Poltergeist, Return of the Jedi, Neverending Story, Temple of Doom, Goonies, Back to the Future, Young Sherlock Holmes, Howard the Duck, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So very cool special effects Mm -hmm. all around. Jamie Gillis played Designer. He also played Dracula in 1980s dracula exotica which is just porn as is most of his imdb so he's the was he the boss at the the boss that was telling her to go dinner yeah luke riley played conductor he was imus in howard stern's private parts presumably don imus the other shock jock tim marquart played mugger central park he played carlos in getting wasted last year and bernardo in the hunter now, is Bernardo the guy that drove the car out of the parking structure into the river? In The Hunter? Yeah. I don't remember. I think so. Al Cerullo played helicopter pilot. He's an actual helicopter pilot. And last year he also played one in Simon. And later this year he'll play one in Escape from New York. Carl A. Wickman was the other helicopter pilot. He plays one in Capricorn 1. Blue Thunder, Rambo 2, Short Circuit, Jaws the Revenge, Overboard, Rambo 3, and Die Hard 2. All helicopter pilot credits. What a coincidence. (laughs) Steve Dash played ATAC Man. He was Jason's stunt double later this year for Friday the 13th Part 2. John Devaney played another ATAC Man. He was John Rogers in The First Deadly Sin last year. Paul Farentino played ATAC Man. He was Max's chauffeur in Just Tell Me What You Want. And Message Cop in the exterminator (laughs) i don't know who message cop was but good on you edward fox played atac man (laughs) he was inspector craddock in mirror cracked last year that was the nephew of the marple character yeah yeah uh he's the jackal in the day of the jackal he's general dyer in gandhi and he's m in never say never again so those are big roles for him to be playing a random ATAC man. He must have just mm-hmm. been around and they were like, you want to be in this scene? Roger Kane played ATAC man. He's also in <laughs> Dracula Exotica. <laughs> that Dracula porn I mentioned earlier as Sergeant Blick. Is this, is this a thing that you can do? Can you just have people 
with the same character name over and over and over again? I guess, if they all really want credits. Catherine Mary Stewart played the sales girl who exploded in the store. Did you yeah. recognize her? Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> She's one of those kids from Moose Jaw from the Apple last year. Oh. She's also Maggie Gordon in Last Starfighter. She's Gwen Saunders in Weekend at Bernie's and Regina Belmont in Night of the Comet. But she was just around and they were auditioning for people and she was like, I guess I'll audition. And they blow her up in the first scene. I was like, for sure, Catherine Mary Stewart's going to be around for this whole movie. They're not yeah, just going to yeah, kill yeah. her in the first scene. But they did. Frederick Treves played the chief police inspector. If the name sounds familiar, it's because he played Alderman in The Elephant Man last year. But it's also the name of Anthony Hopkins' character in that film, who in reality was this actor's great uncle. Huh. Frederick Treves. It's weird. Jim Beaver played Subway Passenger. He was Leland Depart in Thunder Alley, and more recently, he was Whitney Ellsworth on Deadwood, Shelby Parlow on Justified, and he's Lawson in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, the guy that sells weapons to people. Yes. Love that guy. Yes. Uh, he's also sec def Robert Singer on who The Boys. He? Who was he in this one? He was a subway passenger. Oh, okay. I was like, I didn't, I yeah, didn't see I, him anywhere. Yeah, I think I would have noticed him. I would have noticed yeah. Ellsworth anywhere. Yeah, he's great. Catherine Carlin played Disco Dancer. She is currently Dr. Harrison on Doom Patrol. What is Doom Patrol? That's that, uh, it's like DC characters. I think Brendan Fraser is on there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a robot. And then the girl from Orange is the New Black. It's a weird superhero team up show. Cool. Billy Perkins played Terrified Subway Woman. I think that's the one right next to when the lady gets the knife put to her neck because she's just screaming uncontrollably. So, it, so it's not the, the hostage? Um, it could be the hostage. I don't know. But she played a commune member in Simon last year, and they were all pretty young. I think the hostage was an older lady. Mm. Um, she played a girl in the rain in Tribute, which I think is outside the museum when it starts raining and then they run home. Mm. And then she played a waitress in The Jazz Singer, which I'm assuming is for the blackface performance at the beginning <laughs> of the film. Those are all the credits I had for this one. It's more than you needed. <laughs> Uh, I think that's everything for Nighthawks. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We have a Discord now. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Caveman, which IMDb describes like so. A caveman seeks revenge on a much larger competitor for the hand of a beautiful cave woman. <laughs> we leave you now <laughs> with the trailer for Caveman. Is there going to be a trailer? There's no dialogue. I think there's a trailer. It might, you, just you might just hear some music. Hmm. Maybe some bonk sounds or a fart. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen this one yet. The dawn of civilization. Primitive. Dangerous. Exciting. Wet. And sloppy. Caveman. The handwriting is on the wall. If the human race is ever going to amount to anything, it needs a leader. Will it be Tonda? He is strong. How about Gog? Gog is out of sight. And Atuk. Atuk sounds good. Atuk will be the leader of the Stone Age. He will teach man to walk erect. He will discover fire. He will invent roast chicken. And fried eggs. Sunny side up. He will inspire the men. And Zug Zug the women. A Tukala Zug Zug? Yeah. A Tuk Zug Zug Lana. A Tuk.
he will protect them from all the beasts of the earth. Ringo Starr, Barbara Bach, Dennis Quaid, Shelley Long, John Matuzak, Avery Schreiber, and Jack Guilford. Caveman. They don't call it the Stone Age for nothing. <laughs> <laughs>